Um, I'm super happy to have uh, Elad Lapidot uh, uh, join us today. Elad and I actually go back to a time uh, when we were, I guess, one of the first um, Israelis that did meet at the Shtabi to write our PhDs back in the day when I really remember when I heard Arabic on the street, I thought that might be Hebrew. So like Hebrew was so far fetched from everything in Berlin and things have changed quite a bit. So it's great to have you here. Elad will talk to us about reflections on, on the anti-anti-Semitic question on genocide and the epistemocide. I hope I said that correctly. Elad Lapidot is a professor for Hebraic studies at the University of Lille in France. He's holding a PhD in philosophy from the Paris Sorbonne University. He has taught philosophy, Jewish thought, and Talmud at many different universities, at the University of Bern in Switzerland and the Humboldt University and the Frey University in Berlin. His work is guided by questions concerning the relations between knowledge and politics. Um, among his publications are The Jews Out of the Question, a critique of anti-antisemitism, which is a uh, part of the uh, presentation he will give us today. Um, he's also published on Hegel's Phenomenologie des Geistes, um, Heidegger and the Jewish Thought, and uh, Difficult Others uh, that was edited with uh, Michael uh, Rumlik. Um, then, as I mentioned, we are very happy to have uh, Daniel Hershkovitz from the Faculty of Theology and Religion in Oxford. Um, Daniel is, um, yeah, is a, a currently a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at the Faculty of Theology and Religion, and he's working on the research project Jewish Existentialism and the Legacy of Mar Martin Luther. He was previous, previously a career research fellow in Jewish studies at Wolfson College and a postdoctoral fellow of, at the religion department at Columbia University. And Daniel is the author of over 20 studies on modern philosophy, modern Jewish thought, Jewish Christian relations, political theology, secularization and nationalism. His first book, Heidegger and his Jewish Recep Reception was published uh, quite recently in 2021 and was awarded the Salo uh, W. and Jeanette Barron Young Scholars Award for Scholarly Excellence. His essay Between Exclusion and Intersection, Heidegger's Philosophy and Jewish Volksism, uh, was the winner of the Leo Beck Year Book Essay Prize um, two years ago in 2020. So thank you so much for joining us, um, giving the floor to Elad now, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to this talk. Thank you uh, very much, Reut, uh, for this presentation uh, and for the invitation also to Tilo. And uh, thank you, all of you who are here uh, for your time and attention. Um, I am always uh, proud and happy when I can speak uh, in a forum of uh, legal scholars or jurists because uh, I am actually coming from law. Um, and I like to think that although uh, disciplinarily I went um, maybe to other places, I always still remain somehow a jurist. Um, I don't know to what extent what I'm gonna to say today, um, how it is connected to the question of law. Um, I'm sure it is connected, uh, but maybe that's, that's a good place to think it together with you. What I will, what I will do um, in, in the time that is given to me is I will try to uh, um, try to describe some basic uh, claims that I made in my in my recent book um, on on antisemitism or or anti antisemitism. I could say a lot um, and I could say um, little um, I We'll try to uh, fit the, the, the time that uh, Reut, uh, that you uh, mentioned, 20, 25 minutes. If uh, somehow I forget myself, just stop me uh, and we can, uh, we can say more during the discussion. And I'm sure also through Tanya's response, there will be things that could be developed. Um, the book or the subtitle of the book is A Critique of Anti-Antisemitism. And uh, the German title, uh, by the way, is only uh, um, 
critique of anti-antisemitism. So that's the point of the book. Now, I should say it is never um, it is never superfluous to say that when I criticize anti-antisemitism, I don't make a case for anti-Semitism. That's not the point of my book. Um, what I'm trying to do is, on, is quite on the contrary, I try to develop an internal critique of, uh, of, of, of let's say, the theoretical resistance uh, to anti-Semitism by analyzing or by looking more closely on certain, on what I think are certain dominant strategies that has been used on the level of theory mainly in uh, by philosophers and intellectuals after, uh, after the Holocaust to develop a, 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 a theoretical discourse that will counter, resist, fight, struggle, prevent, eradicate anti-Semitism. So I'm, I'm questioning the, uh, let's say the, the, the uh, efficiency uh, or, the, uh, or, the, or the wisdom of, of the main, of the central stat strategies that I think that were uh, chosen and that are still uh, operative. And you could say that my basic argument is there is a, a problem. There is a problem in the dominant strategy of anti-antisemitism. And uh, you could say that the problem is that uh, this strategy, as I will try to claim now, uh, has developed uh, in a counterproductive way. Namely, instead of achieving uh, what it wants to achieve, namely uh, precisely uh, get away, uh, steer away from um, antisemitism, um, it in many ways uh, um, find itself theoretically complicit structurally complicit uh, with with anti anti uh, with anti-semitic discourse so anti anti-semitism and anti-semitism in important ways converge this is this is my provocative claim uh, that I will try to to explain quickly now um, there are different I'm not the only one who criticized on the philosophical and theoretical level dominant structures of anti-antisemitism there are others who have done so. Um, one of the more um, well-known strategies that is not my strategy, but I should tell you that you know uh, that it exists. Uh, many have criticized anti-Semitism anti for only focusing on anti-Judaism and forgetting uh, that anti-Semitism historically and also the discourse of Semitism also included uh, Muslims and also was based on anti-Islam. So many criticize uh, that in contemporary anti-antisemitism, the, the, the um, struggle against uh, uh, anti-Islamism is, is forgotten, uh, which I think is, is a good point. I don't, I, don't, I don't think it's wrong to say that. I think it's important. It is nonetheless not my point. It is not the point of my book. What I'm claiming in the book, uh, in analogy is that anti-antisemitism doesn't uh, only forget uh, Muslims, but also forgets Jews. That's, that's my point. And hence the, hence the, the title of, of the English book, Jews Out of the Question. Um, now, there is, of course, a pun here in Jews out of the question, as you can surely hear. There is uh, the ambivalence of um, wanting to uh, stop the Jewish question, as it has been uh, operative as a, as a major topos of anti-Semitic discourse. So anti-antisemitism wishes to uh, part with, with the anti-Semitic Jewish question. So there is a positive, so to speak, uh, a, a attempt to do away with a, with a hate, a, a, a clear hate speech. Um, on the other hand, uh, and this is my point, the strategy uh, that it chooses to do so is to push 
push uh, Jews or Judaism or Jewish culture outside the realm of uh, questions. So um, hence the uh, English expression uh, out, of a, out of the question in the sense of uh, this is not something that we should discuss. It is out of the question. Um, so the ambivalency that I'm talking about is on the one hand wanting to um, in a positive, uh, caritative, uh, commendable way, stop a certain hate speech, anti-Semitic hate speech. On the other hand, uh, doing so by simply uh, uh, silencing all speech about uh, Jews, about Jews. Or more specifically, and here I'm coming to the core of my claim, stop or silence discourse about Jews as precisely something that is discursive, as something that belongs to the realm of questions, discussions, what we can call the domain of knowledge, the domain of thought, the domain of theory. We're talking, I'm talking about theory, about philosophy. So uh, silence uh, the epistemic discussion of Jews or of Judaism. Hence, uh, I'm speaking in my book when I criticize dominant anti-antisemitic discourse, I, I'm speaking about a certain effect, a certain phenomenon of de-epistemizing Jews, de-epistemizing Jews, namely taking the entire complex uh, of questions relating to Judaism and pushing it outside of the realm of knowledge, of theory. Now, what I'm trying to show basically in the book through um, readings in different uh, uh, prominent, let's say philosophers and theoreticians of anti-Semitism after the Holocaust, such as uh, Sartre and Adorno and Horkheimer and Hannah Arendt and others, what I'm trying to show uh, is that a, a basic strategy of anti-antisemitism has been and still is criticizing, condemning antisemitism in a surprising way, not so much for being anti. So not so much for attributing negative statements, negative values to uh, Jews and Jewish culture, but in a surprising way for attributing any value, any ideas, any principles, any forms of thought or content of thought uh, to Jews, defining knowledge or thought or notions or ideas as Jewish. Namely, uh, a very important thrust of post-Holocaust anti-antisemitism has been and still is to condemn antisemitism not for thinking against Jews, or not primarily even to thinking of thinking against Jews, but for thinking of Jews for discussing Jews or Jewish thought or Jewish culture as a relevant uh, entity within the realm of, of, of knowledge. Namely, anti-Semitism has been condemned or the disc discourse has been condemned as anti-Semitic for treating Jews or Jewish collectives or Jewish culture again is a carrier, as a historical agent of some kind of knowledge, what I call epistemic agent, Jews for being epistemic agent. So the critique targets any attempt to try to claim that Jewish culture somehow stands for some meaningful and specific content 
as constitutive for Jewish existence, historical Jewish existence, as something that you can like and perhaps even adopt or dislike and criticize, something that you can be pro or anti. This has been criticized and still does, I think, as a dominant strategy of anti-antisemitism, according to my readings at least. Now, um, I want to point out two corollaries, two consequences of this strategy that I diagnose as a dominant in anti-antisemitic discourse. One consequence is how antisemitism is perceived by anti-antisemitic theory. If, if you, um, as I claim anti-antisemitism does, if you uh, dismiss any, no any knowledge or any claim or any perception uh, of Jews or Jewish culture as representing some kind of knowledge, some kind of Judaism, then antisemitism itself is perceived in so far as it does speak about Jewish knowledge, is perceived as something that has no connection to reality. Antisemitism hence is understood to be less on the level of knowledge or of some perception, even, a, even distorted perception of reality and is treated as more of a psychological condition. Um, as Adorno and Hockheimer said, uh, some kind of a mental sickness, uh, a personality disorder, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, such that the study of anti-Semitism becomes the study of anti-Semites. It's a science of anti-Semites, you could say, uh, where precisely one of the epistemological principles is that we don't know about Jews because it's irrelevant because it, it, you can say nothing meaningful about Jews as a collective. And I think there is a whole literature uh, that, uh, that uh, you could, you could uh, attribute to this kind of tendency. For example, different uh, historiographies of uh, anti-Semitism or anti-Judaism that only focus on uh, anti-Semitic ideas without looking at, uh, at, at, at the, the, the Jewish collectives or cultures to which they claim to relate. So that's the first consequence of how anti-Semitism is conceived. A second consequence is, and it follows from the first one, that uh, the anti-antisemitism I'm criticizing rejects in principle any claim of existence of Jewish knowledge, or as I say, Jewish episteme, resists or dismisses any such position or any such claim as anti-Semitic as fantastic, as mythological. Now, what does this mean? And this is what I problematize in my book or uh, in my claims. What I'm saying is that this situation where anti-Semitism is defined as the assertion of Jewish episteme leads anti-anti-Semitism, contemporary post-Holocaust anti-anti-Semitism to what I, at the beginning, called complicity with anti-Semitism. What I mean is that condemning anti-Semitism for conceptualizing the Jewish or condemning any conceptualization of Jewish culture, any assertion of Jewish knowledge as anti-Semitic, very easily, and I show that in my book, veers, turns 
into a kind of anti-Judaism, namely critique of assertion of Jewish knowledge, thought, and culture by Jews, self-identifying Jews. And in fact, next to anti-Semites, historically, Jews has been more adamant in talking about Judaism. So anti-antisemitism, so I claim, at a certain critical moment, quickly turns into anti-Judaism. This is the complicity I was talking about. Now, I want to be even more provocative and say that to some extent, anti-antisemitism reaches even more negative dismissal of Judaism than antisemitism even more negative, more negative because it does not just criticize it, it claims it does not exist or it criticizes the assertion that it exists. And this is where the title of my talk today becomes relevant when I'm talking about genocide and epistemocide. Now, uh, as you know, genocide is, uh, the uh, mass murder of a race or of a people. Epistemocide is the murder of knowledge. Now, it's not a word that I invent. It is already in use. For example, uh, in what is called the Global South, uh, there has been already, uh, there have been people who were talking about um, colonialism is uh, having the effect not only of killing a lot of people, but of destroying or eradicating cultures. So it's not a new concept, but I think that in the specific case of anti-antisemitism, we can speak about epistemocidal tendencies. Now, of course, it should be made clear. I don't think that any of the authors that I talk about wants to eradicate, kill, or destroy anything. I think uh, people are uh, doing it basically uh, in good intentions. So it's well intended. Uh, it uh, wants to fight racism, anti Semitism. Uh, I just think, and this is why I critique, that it is misguided in some moments and it achieves the exact contrary of what it wants to achieve. And this is why I think it is important to say that. Um, now, I'm not sure how much time I have left, but... Um, you can take some time. Yeah, a few minutes still. Okay. We'll so, <laughs> okay, so I, I want to add a second level of critique. So far, I told you what I find problematic in a certain... I called it epistemocidal, a certain negatory, uh, exterminatory, some tendency of eradicating that I find in the basically well-intended anti-antisemitism. I now want to add a second, uh, a second level of critique about a positive effect of anti-antisemitism, and I will explain what I mean by positive. Positive, not in the sense in good and happy, but in the sense of not subtracting something, like taking out, negating, but of adding something, of positing something. This is what I mean, positive. So the second critique that I developed in the book is concerns precisely the uh, positive, uh, well-intended um, um, tendency of anti-antisemitism. It is pro-Jewish. It doesn't, uh, like anti-Semites, wants to uh, criticize Jews. It thinks of itself, and of course, historically, and uh, 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 in the contemporary times, it is deployed for the benefit of, or in understanding of uh, going towards, or showing a positive uh, a attitude towards Jews, uh, co correcting uh, hostility. 
what this means is that anti antisemitism is not only negating epistemic Judaism, it is also asserting some kind of Jewish existence that it wants to protect. So there is a positive aspect of anti antisemitism, namely in that it posits a certain figure, a certain mode of Jewish existence that it pretends to be the real one, the true one, and uh, that uh, should be protected. Now, the positive Jewishness or the positive Jewish collect uh, collective or Jewish culture that anti-antisemitism posits, so I claim and show in my book, is in an unsurprising way, a collective that is a de-epistemicized collective, a collective that has no knowledge. Jews or the Jewish collective as a collective that has no knowledge, that is, to make it more clear, that is defined by its lack of knowledge, its lack of epistemic um, dimension. And I think that the most uh, clear way or most paradigmatic way in which this kind of collective is asserted is by using something like uh, life, categories like life. So talking about living Jews or Jews flesh and blood that are contrasted with the uh, Jews that are figurative or that are metaphorical or that are epistemic. So it's not Jews of ideas. It's not Jews that are defined by ideas or by knowledge. It's Jews that are defined by life or even bare life. Provocatively, we can speak here about biopolitics against what I call epistemopolitics. Now, I claim that this assertion, positive assertion of de-epistemicized Jewishness or Judaism is an important feature of anti-antisemitism, but it is not only anti-antisemitism that does this. I think the assertion of a biopolitical collective is something that goes beyond Judaism, that is a phenomenon that has already thematized as having an important um, um, role in, in, our, uh, in our age. I think in con connection to Judaism, this is also operative. And I think anti-antisemitism is only one of the ways in which it is done. Uh, I will not develop it now, just a, a hint. Now, I will maybe close uh, my talk having spoken about the two uh, uh, critiques, the negative and the positive, so to speak, effects of anti-antisemitism, I will just say that on a more, on a higher, let's say, more abstract conceptual level, indeed, I take the entire issue of anti-antisemitism uh, to be an important phenomena of what I call a problem of political epistemology, a contemporary problem of trying to understand what, is, what are collectives, what is a collective subject, what is a political subject, and how collectives are connected to knowledge. Now, that's a big issue, and there are many people who have already written about it, and just telling you that what I'm saying, I think, is another building block in this uh, uh, debate. So I think for the sake of those who are interested in this direction, that anti-antisemitism uh, represents a, a problematic, I think, phenomena of dissociating uh, uh, politics and knowledge, to say it very, very quickly. Um, I could say more, but I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that I said already a lot. And um, uh, I suggest that it would be a moment to breathe and let uh, Daniel uh, uh, respond, unless you want me to say more. I think we could uh, give Daniel the floor and then we'll definitely you know, ask more and get more answers at the Q&A. So Daniel, the floor is yours. And as I just mentioned at, in the chat, 
Um, yeah, you guys can turn your cameras on right now if, if you're interested, because I think I got some messages of some of you who want to do that. So uh, yeah, hi, uh, Diane. <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much uh, for this. And uh, yeah, Daniel, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to respond to um, Ilad's uh, book. Um, what I hope to do in the next, say, 10 or, or, or 12, 13 minutes is um, to offer a few reflections and thoughts on, um, on the book and also uh, pose a few questions that I hope will contribute to the discussion that um, will, will follow. So, Elad offers a, a provocative thesis about how post-World War II intellectual discourse um, against anti-Semitism uh, developed, and he calls it anti-anti-Semitism. Um, and as we heard right now, he claims that this, source, this discourse is primarily a form or a claim about knowledge, but it's a negative claim. And its basic flaw is not so much that it is anti, that is that it is anti-Jews or the hatred about um, you know of Jews, but the claim for knowledge of Jews, right? So it, the knowledge, which the stance of anti 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 anti-Semitism claims, um, holds no relation to actual Jews, right? So um, when anti anti-Semitism rejects anti-Semitism's claim for knowledge, it in fact rejects the possibility of any knowledge of Jews. So anti-Semitism anti anti sees the problem with anti-Semitism anti as above all, the very thought of Jews, right? So the claim, the defense against anti-Semitism results in situating the Jewish outside of the realm of thought in the sense that any engagement with Jews or the Jews, as Elad writes in his book with scare quotes, um, as an object of thought is by definition anti-Semitism, right? We, we, you could not think about Jews. So while staging a clash or seemingly staging a clash between opposing sides, um, the discourse itself is framed by a shared negative political epistemology. There is nothing to know with regards to Jews. And any such knowledge, um, if someone claims to have it, is projection, myth, illusion, disfiguration, right? And Elad just um, said that the talk about anti-Semitism becomes a talk about um, the psychology of anti-Semites. So Jews are beyond the realm of thought um, because anything Jewish cannot be an object of judgment. Or as Elad puts it in his book, <clears throat> the Jews have come to signify the limit or end of philosophy. Now, this critique um, is, is achieved in this book through an original and uh, at time dazzling analysis of an impressive line of philosophers and intellectuals. Um, and I think that this is a remarkable feat of, uh, on its own of the book. Um, but what I found to be um, the greatest and also the most basic contribution that this book offers is, is the very introduction of this new concept, of a new perspective that Elad calls anti-antisemitism, which now, now that we know it, now that we have a term for it, now we, that we have it as a lens, um, it can now be identified in public statements, in philosophical positions, in the media, um, and can be debated and discussed in scholarly context. So what Elad has done is shine original light, like original light, or to use a different metaphor to uncover new ground by introducing um, and analyzing a new concept, right? So he offers a new way of approaching an already much debated and much discussed topic that this forum here um, knows very well. Now, as, as we know, often debates about anti-Semitism um, and the discourse about anti-Semitism often is about the correct definition or where precisely one crosses the line between non-anti-Semitism and anti-Semitism. Um, and I think what Elad has done here um, is offer an original reorganization of the discourse itself. And this does not happen often 
And I think it's important to be aware um, of this significant achievement. Now, one point that for me came out very clearly in this book um, is just how rich and remarkable and even diverse the tradition of anti-antisemitism is. So according to Elad's book, it has weak and strong versions as different strands and developments, variant, you know, sides of a singular claim. Um, and think of the thinkers that Elad identifies as participating in this discourse. We have Adorno and Horkheimer, we have Sartre, we have Arendt, Bourdieu, Nancy. Now these are not second rate thinkers and they are themselves quite diverse between you know, their, their own um, philosophical and political stances. And they span the entirety of post-World War um, 20th century. So this is, this is a remarkable um, tradition. Now, I wanna offer a few questions and comments, which I hope will then be, um, you know, contribute to the discussion. So the first point I wanna make um, comes as a form as a, as a question or rather two, a two part question about the negations um, that uh, Elad is occupied in. And he, he mentioned this briefly um, at the beginning of his talk, right? So what, what this book is actually is an anti, anti, anti-Semitism, right? That's the claim. It's a critique, it's the first anti of anti, anti-Semitism. Um, and my two questions are about the third anti, the third negation that is Elad's position, the one that is presented in this book, his critique of anti, anti-Semitism. So my first question is this, what is the nature of this third negation, right? So the nature of your critique um, and how does it not simply uh, re negate the anti-antisemitism and therefore return to the first negation, to the antisemitism, the negation or hatred of Jews? Now you started out your talk, Elad, by saying that of course by critiquing anti-antisemitism, you do not in any way um, seek to, you know, to endorse anti-Semitism. But my, my question to you is how then? How do we not return um, to, the, to the negation of negation, which, return, which brings us back to the first position um, that, we, that you know, we started out with, right? Um, sometimes you could just simply, so many negations just returns to the original position. So where do we end up? Um, after we critique anti-antisemitism and how do we not end up with the first negation? My second question is related to the first one. Um, what I find very interesting and, and thought provoking in Elad's analysis, um, and he doubled down on it um, in this talk right now, um, is that he's suggesting that the discourse of anti-antisemitism is in fact a form of anti-Semitism, or as we heard today, um, even worse than anti-Semitism, because it disallows talk about the Jews at all. It erases the possibility of thinking or knowing Jews. It situates Jews beyond the realm of thought, or as Elad put it today, it is a form of epist epistemicide. Um, now, in this respect, we might call the second negation, right, the, the position of anti-antisemitism that Elad is criticizing, um, this negation we could consider it a Hegelian negation, and I'll say exactly what I mean by this. Um, I mean that it is a negation, it's an anti, that rejects the certain position and therefore um, claims to move forward in the discussion by negating a certain position, but in its movement forward, it also preserves something um, of the position that it was, that it claims to have negated, right? So it negates anti-Semitism, it rejects it, but in that rejection, it also preserves something of the anti-Jewishness that it claims to have negated. So now my question to Elad is this, what kind of negation is your negation, is your critique? Is it a complete negation of the stance of anti-Antisemitism so that you completely reject it and there's nothing that is preserved? Or is there something that is carried forward, carried forth in your critique, something that is preserved from the position of anti-antisemitism. Um, is there something that should be preserved from that position? Um, is there something worth preserving, except, you know, I'm assuming 
the critical stance against anti-Semitism? Are there any positive elements in anti anti-Semitism um, that we should hold on to, despite the very strong terms that you you spoke in, um, with today, um, and in light of the second critique that you mentioned today, uh, where you talked about the positive aspect of anti anti-Semitism in terms of positing a specific uh, form of positive Jewishness that is itself empty or vacant, um, and and you know. If I if I could add a third question, um, uh, which may be relevant specifically to this context of legal scholars, what do you think are the possible challenges and difficulties that could perhaps arise from reinserting Jewishness or Judaism into thought? Right. So the position of anti anti uh, Semitism, um, the banishing of Jewishness from thought, uh, happened as a reaction. As a reaction to anti-Semitism and to horrors that um, that took place, so how do we not enter into a familiar and painful cycle, or fall into same into you know the same familiar pitfalls of history when um, Jews were thought? Now, of course, I'm not saying that we should not keep Jews that we should keep Jews and Judaism out of the discourse, but again, my question is how? How do we do it correctly? Um, now, the final point I wish to raise um, is that naturally, after so many antis, so many negations, the reader could only expect some kind of positive construction. Um, and Elad, in the conclusion of this book, makes clear that he did not, that the book is aimed to prepare the ground um, by taking down, by demolishing. Um, an unsteady, problematic, and even dangerous conceptual structure that kind of dominates the discourse on anti-Semitism. Um, and in, in order to, to make room for the constructive account that will follow. Now, we want to ask Elad um, to perhaps elaborate a little on this constructive account. It's not found in the, pos in the, in this, the present book that we're discussing, um, but the reader does get some hints about what uh, Elad envisions it might look like. So what Elad offers is a return to the Talmud as a possible site in which um, the reinsertion of Jewishness into the realm of thought um, can perhaps happen. Um, now, of course, many Jews never left the Talmud, but what Elad has in mind, it seems to me, is a specific return to the Talmud. Um, we might call it a return to a philosophical Talmud or to a thinking Talmud. Um, and it's a return that goes through, and this is definitely relevant to this forum, it goes through and is inspired by the philosopher Martin Heidegger, um, who um, occupies an important place in the book, but wasn't mentioned in Elad's talk today. Um, Heidegger is a very important 20th century German philosopher. Um, whose philosophy is extremely important and, and influential and, and um, challenging. Um, but what is often most known about Heidegger was that he was a member of the Nazi party. Um, and in many respects, his philosophy is tainted by um, his political affiliation. Um, now, taking Heidegger as your inspiration for turning to the Talmud, um, may be somewhat controversial for some, but let me assure you that um, in this Elad is in fact following the footsteps of the Talmud itself, um, which was not afraid of offering redemptive opportunities, even to the figures it considered the greatest enemies of the Jews. And the, the example I have in mind specifically right now is the, the rabbinic claim that the children of the children of Haman, the villain of the book of Esther, um, Haman who tried to exterminate all the Jews, um, the rabbi said that his descendants ended up studying Torah in the land of Israel. So by not being deterred by Heidegger's affiliation with Nazism and his deeply problematic attitude towards Jews, um, and by, willing, by his willingness to identify um, in Heidegger redemptive potential for Jewish thoughts, so Elad is in good rabbinic company. But what I think should not go unnoticed is that Elad calls to return to the Talmud. Okay, so we're talking about an ancient text 
the majority of which was written in a language no longer spoken, Aramaic. Um, 1,500 years back uh, in time, um, does the fact that we need to return to the Talmud in order to find some kind of basis to construct um, and create Jewish thought and reinsert Judaism into thought, does that not mean that perhaps the anti-anti-Semites are correct? That is, that currently there is nothing to know about Jews, um, that there is no Jewish thought actually, um, or at least, you know, perhaps until Elad's next book will, will be published and he will demonstrate or, or, or enact the reinsertion of um, Jews into thought. Um, now, not, I don't mean to be ironic or cynical or, or glib. Um, I, I await the publication of Elad's book, um, next book very much, and I, I know it will be as rich and formed as, and as, as the one we're discussing now. But my point is that perhaps, despite the title, A Critique of Anti-Anti-Semitism, um, I read this book and, um, and Elad's talk today as a call, um, maybe even a cry, um, enough with all the antis, right? Why are we stuck um, with all these negations and negations of negations? I, I read Elad's book as saying, where is positive Jewish thought? Where is Jewish critique? Why aren't Jews thinking? Why are pe aren't people thinking Judaism? Why are, do Jews allow the discourse to insert them outside of the realm of thought? Why is Judaism omitted from the public's discourse as a positive knowledge and only appears in the public discourse in the form of accusations of anti-Semitism? Now, if my reading of this book is correct um, and beyond its critical engagement with a long line of modern uh, thinkers, anti-Semites and anti-anti-Semites, um, if in this book there is also an implicit call for more constructive Jewish thought, then, um, then this book is not only about anti-Semitism and anti-Semitism, and its scope and ambition is much wider and um, much more impressive. Thank you.